Okay, we are live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the iOS Lead Essentials podcast. I'm Mike. And I'm Kayo. And in this episode, we're going to talk about a very, very, very serious topic, the solid principles. We're going to do an overview of the solid principles and some of their applications on iOS. We're going to give an example and an example of a violation. Yes. So why you should do it and what happens if you don't do it. Exactly. <laughs> Well, bad things happen, like spoiler alert. Yes. But let's dive right into them. All right. Okay, simple question to start with. What are the solid principles? What is it about? What is the goal? Right. Uh, so we have five principles, each one of the letters of the acronym, SOLID. Yes. And we're going to dive right into them. But the goal basically is to create... So these are guidelines that help you create maintainable and testable software. Good software. Good. In other terms, good <laughs> software. Exactly. Yes. Software that is flexible, soft, right? Exactly. Yes. So it's easy to develop, maintain, extend, test. That's it. All right. So how did they come to be? Who created them? So... Legend has it that <laughs> Robert C. Martin uh, created uh, the Solid Principles. And I have a reference here from, it's an excerpt from uh, his book, Clean Architecture, published in 2016. All right. And Robert C. Martin says here, the history of the Solid Principles is long. I began to assemble them in the late 80s while debating software design principles with others on Usenet, an early kind of Facebook. Over the years, the principles have shifted and changed. Some were deleted, others were merged, still others were added. The final grouping stabilized in the early 2000s, although I presented them in a different order. In 2004, or thereabouts, Michael Feathers sent me an email saying that if I rearrange the principles, their first words would spell the word solid. And thus, the solid principles were born. Great name. Good for marketing. Yeah. Solid software. They nailed it. So the solid principles have been around for a while, maybe with different names. Yes. So Robert C. Martin didn't create those principles. He collected them, organized them, gave it a name in a nice acronym. <laughs> exactly. And presented it to us in a very concise form to help us create good software. Yes. So there's a lot to learn from those principles. Yes, absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are so many other things involved, you know, uh, as, the, as the foundation for these principles that we're talking about decades of uh, experimentation and study of other disciplines as well. Application, right? So if you learn the solid principles, you're going to save so much time by learning exactly. from others. Yes, yes. Another notable mention that uh, in his book, Eric S. Raymond, The Art of Unix Programming, well, he doesn't talk about the solid principles per se, uh, but, well, because there was no acronym back then, probably. But again, like this book contains a lot of principles, um, a lot of guidelines and rules that help you create modular, uh, easy, uh, easy to change systems. Yes, and that's it. The solid principles are not the only principles. There are not only five principles that dictate everything, how you should build software, right? But they are fundamental guidelines that if you follow them, you're most likely going to end up with good software. Exactly. Exactly. So They're not the only ones. As you said, read The Art of Unix. It's a great book. And if you want more books, you can find it in the show notes. So that's yep. it. Learn from the best. Yep. Read the books. You're going to save so much time. And it's almost free. Come on. 20 bucks I mean, a book. It's a no-brainer. Like, I don't think there's another way. You know, like, you, you just need to put the work in and get these ideas, gather the ideas, and then just apply them. But, yeah, we're incredibly lucky to, to have them. Indeed. Okay, so let's go one by one. 
the solid principles, the first one, the S in solid. Okay. What is the single responsibility principle? So the the single responsibility principle states that every every component should have uh, one and only one responsibility. And now you know, like here is where the chaos begins. What, <laughs> what is a responsibility? <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, a responsibility is let's let's make this clarification. A responsibility is not just a single method, right? That's I think that's yes. the the big the biggest misconception out there that. If, uh, if I make a class that has just one method, I conform to the single responsibility principle. Mm -hmm. No, that's, that's, that's not true. Maybe uh, it is, but that's not the goal. Having just one method is not going to cut it for you. That's even a better answer. Exactly. <laughs> maybe, it must, maybe, it, maybe it is true, but uh, that's not the case always. Exactly. Because yes. like, sometimes to fulfill a responsibility, you need more than one method. Yes. Are you going to break one method in multiple methods just to make it more readable, right? It's not the point is not to create only one function per component, per class, per struct or whatever. It's to fulfill one responsibility. Exactly. So what is a responsibility? And that's that's where I start getting messy, right? Because it's it's not easy to define a responsibility. Because yep. a single responsibility in one system might be fine in one system, but in another system you need to break it down more. It depends on the context. It depends on the challenge at hand. It's not as simple as saying, okay, this is one responsibility or not. So how can you go through your code and realize, well, is this doing more than one thing? Is this, doing, is this fulfilling more than one responsibility? And there is a guideline for it, which is looking for how many reasons does this component has to change? Mm -hmm. It's about change. Because exactly. you want to make your software easier to change, to extend, to add more features, or maybe to remove features, or to replace a system with another, or replace a framework with another. So you need to ask yourself, how many reasons does this component has to change? If it has more than one reason, you're probably fulfilling more than one responsibility. Thus, you need to break it into more components. So you have like single purpose components that fulfill one responsibility each. So you can compose them differently, you can reuse them, you can implement them in isolation, you can test them in isolation. Exactly, exactly. Because that's how they, like, this is, this is very important what you're saying right now, because if you, if you enclose them in this single component, then this single component becomes reusable, it becomes composable. And if you see it from this modular zoomed in version, that you create just one single component that has these traits. Well, when you create a bunch of these components, you end up with a, with a modular code base. You end up with like uh, uh, modules that are pluggable. And yes. that, that leads to what we said in the beginning, software, you know, uh, software that is soft, like it's easy to change. That's, that's the goal. You should yes. aim for that. All right. So example. What is an example of the single responsibility principle in practice? Okay, so uh, a classic example is the, let's say, the, the cache. Let's say an in-memory cache, mm -hmm. right? That you can add things to the cache, you can remove things from the cache, and you can retrieve things from the cache. So you have three methods right there, right? Yes. So no one method, you have three. So if this component has these three operations, does it fulfill more than one responsibility? It depends on the system, but usually no, because all of those operations are related to one responsibility, managing this cache, this in-memory cache. Exactly, exactly. And then the other question is, what, are, what is your client going to require? Uh, perhaps it's going to require, you know, all of them, all these operations, yes. right? So one component having, you know, like a, a single interface with all these three methods there might be um, what you're looking for. But if you have a client that only needs to add things to the cache. Uh, exactly. <laughs> then maybe you need to think about it. Yeah, that's, that's, the, that's the case. It's not definitive. It's not like it always depends, right? There is no mm -hmm. one single rule that is going to solve all the problems and it's going to fit in all cases. No, everything is tailored. and things might change. So 
you know, perhaps having three methods in uh, one component worked in the beginning, it conformed to the single responsibility principle, you know, later you might need to change that. You might need to break down the, the behavior uh, into more components, right? Yes. But that's the essence of a software, you know, like change easily with a cheap, um, cheaply, very, very low cost. That's why you want these things. Yes, because a class that conforms to the single responsibility principle right now, it fulfills one responsibility, maybe by adding one more function to it, makes it violate the principle. And then someone else is going to look at this class tomorrow and they need to add another feature. Well, it already does two things. It doesn't hurt if it does three. The next day, four, five, six, seven. That's, that's it. And suddenly, you cannot break down the class. You cannot test it in isolation, no. and etc. It's done. So every time you're going to add a new feature, you're going to change something in your code, you need to ask yourself, does this class still only fulfills one responsibility or does it do two things now? Because sometimes you may think that being pragmatic is the way to go because it's just one tiny function. But what kind of yep. message are you passing forward to the next developer that's going to come and say, well, it's just another one, just another yep. one. And suddenly you have this massive class. Exactly. So you need discipline. And the single responsibility principle, it's all about discipline. Because most of the times, it's going to sound like, ah, let's be pragmatic. In all fairness, all, also the principles are about discipline. <laughs> yes. But yeah, I, I, that's, that's uh, exactly right. You don't want to introduce the probability, the possibility of something like this happening. Uh, so just find other ways. Don't stuff you know, behaviors <laughs> where they don't belong just because it's easy. Just don't do that. Yeah, it's pragmatic. It's easy, yep. it's simple, it's not going to hurt. Yep. But the accumulation of those decisions will hurt you. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right. So what are some violations of the single responsibility principle? Okay, yeah. All right, so let's say now you need to add another feature to your app. You have your in-memory cache, you can add, you can remove things from the cache, you can retrieve things from the cache, and let's say you are caching an access token and now we have a new feature you need to validate if the access token is still valid when you retrieve it right now if you add this if statement inside your in-memory cache component your class or struct whatever now you're doing two things you're managing the cache and you're validating the access token yes so the if statement refers to the to the to the check the business logic if you want like if yes. an access token is valid or not but the the key point here is the location of these things right where it's happening because if you're working with a cache then you think what 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 is the component i'm working with it's the cache right and now i want to validate something well naturally it feels you know the right thing to do just go and stuff this validation inside your cache component yes well, that's that's probably bad because um, this is like a completely different rule validation caching perhaps it's like a cross application concern concern exactly while validating something is like an extremely application specific yes and maybe sometimes you want to change how you store it instead of in memory you want to store it with let's say core data or the keychain. Mm -hmm. And let's say you have these two ways. Sometimes you want to use an in-memory cache. Sometimes you want to use the keychain. And you need to duplicate the validation logic in the keychain and in the in-memory one. Exactly. Well, no. That's why from the beginning, if you have this new functionality, you put into a validator. A validator that is not concerned where this data is coming from. It could be from in-memory representations, or it can come from core data, realm, from a backend service. It doesn't matter. It only validates the token. Yes, yes, that's absolutely, absolutely. So you can compose it with different stores. <laughs> yeah, that's it. So that's it. Every time you add a new function to a class, every time you need to add more functionality to a component, ask yourself, is this component fulfilling more than one responsibility now? Yes. If you say yes, break it down. Would this have more reasons to change? In this case, you would have more reasons to change. The in-memory cache may change because you want to change how you store it. Or it may change because the validation rules changed. Two reasons to change, two responsibilities. 
So you're talking about being mindful here, right? Like disciplined. Being disciplined, searching for these signals. You are called to add a new API in a component, right? Like this, you want to add new behavior, you want to extend your system, and you need to add this behavior. And you have like a class open in your IDE on Xcode, whatever, right? And you need to ask yourself, is this the right way? Is this the right place? You know, uh, is this the right component that I should add? And it doesn't matter. Is it a method? Is it a property? Is it like, a, it, it doesn't matter like what it is. Like you're just adding stuff somewhere, right? So this is, this is one of those ways that you can control your actions by thinking before doing and saying, yes. yeah, like maybe it doesn't fit there. Maybe it's like exactly what you said, validation with caching. Well, you know, validation is a completely different thing. I should yes. not tie these two together because it was just convenient because Xcode happened to be opened on, on this class, right? Yes. And again, if you might decide to be pragmatic and say, well, it's easy, it's just one line of code, but this accumulates over time, right? A bunch yes. of pragmatic decisions over yes. time, you're going to create a mess. But if you follow the principles, if you're disciplined about it, over time, you're going to end up with a very decomposed, loosely coupled system that is easy to maintain, to add new features, to test, just a pleasure to work with, you know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's a dream. So that's it. Single responsibility principle. Discipline. Separate responsibilities in different components. Don't be afraid of having a lot of components. As long as they are composable, testable, that's the dream. That's what you want. Yep. yep. Next, what is the open-closed principle? The O in solid. Right, right. Yeah, the open-closed principle states that systems should be open for extension and closed for modification. What does that mean? Basically, it means that when you have a component and you want to add code, you don't want to go and change stuff inside the component. So instead of code, let's use the word feature. Let's say you want to add a new feature to the system. Yeah. It should be adding something rather than changing the system to do the new yes. thing. Yes. When you can just add a new feature without changing the current feature, you have less work, first of all less risk of breaking something, right? It's an additive thing. Exactly. And that's exactly. The, the dream. Yeah. You want to be able to add features by adding new code yeah, rather than changing old code. Because changing yeah. old code, especially if you don't have tests, that's risky. <laughs> and that's a different story. Yeah. You should have tests. But even if you have tests, every time you go there and you change code, change code, change code, it means you don't have a very modular system. No. You cannot just no. go and bring new behaviors easily. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and there are multiple ways to achieve that, basically, right? For example? Yeah. So open closed systems uh, need the proper abstractions in place, you know, in order to right. be uh, open closed, basically. And you can achieve that, uh, you know, with a polymorphism. And like you need to be able to have a very good. Um, a method for composing these things, right? For composing right. components. Otherwise, like you can't build on top of already, you know, like uh, implemented code. Yes, because if you can compose a system differently to do different things without changing it, just by composing it differently, then you have an open, closed system. Yes, that's it. Because you just compose the objects differently and they do different things. Exactly. So you can add behavior without changing existing code and perhaps this makes uh the s the the srp rather the the single responsibility principle a bit more clear why you need it because if you if you enclose if you encapsulate all this logic uh, of one responsibility right in just one component then you can use around this component you can reuse and compose it in different ways exactly because like those principles are not isolate things to conform to the open close principle, you need to follow the other principles as well. Yes, yes, pretty much. The open close principle is like a computed principle. It's like the result of, um, of, of, of the result. If you follow the other principles, that's what you get. You get an open closed system. Yes. Right. Exactly. So, what is an example of the open close principle in practice? Let's say in iOS. Okay. Yeah. So let's say. A classic one. You have a, a UI view controller, 
And this view controller presents a list of things and the the list, the data come from uh, a backend, right? From a remote okay. service. So the network, right. A network request. Yes, exactly. Um, so you may, you, you do this feature, everything is fine. You know, like next feature, well, we want to show the same list in case the, 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 the customer doesn't have uh, an internet connection. So you want to cache the results of the requests somehow. And if you don't have internet connection, you want to present the cached version. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the view controller was fetching it from the network, but now it needs to fetch from the cache if the network fails. If the network fails, exactly. So that's a new feature. You are adding a new behavior. You're adding a new behavior. But like for the UI, for the UI view controller, that should not matter. Because the UI view controller should have, you know, like its own responsibilities of managing the, the, the views lifecycle and rendering the views and all that stuff. But the loading from the remote location or from the local location, you know, like that's, that's a completely different uh, matter. Right. It shouldn't matter for the view controller where the data comes from. No. It can come no. from the network, from disk, from an in-memory store. It doesn't matter. Exactly. But for it not to matter, you need to implement a good abstraction. Yes. Right. You need to hide details about the network. You need to hide details about a local store. Yes. Behind exactly. a good interface, like a protocol, yes. maybe a closure. Yes. Because if you can do it, then it means that you can add this feature without changing any line of code in the view controller. Yep. So that means that your view controller is open for extension. You added a new behavior, but closed for modification. You didn't have to modify it to add this new behavior. No, you don't have to change the inside of the of the UI view controller subclass there, right? Yes. It's just stuff that goes around it, right? That you need to add. And this is about a component like a view controller, a class. Mm -hmm. But it can follow the same principle to higher level modules. It can exactly. add behaviors to an entire module by injecting something different to it, you know, by composing it differently, by using any kind of polymorphic interface that allows you to add behavior without changing any code inside the module, the component, the class. Yes, yes, absolutely. And uh, that's a, uh, you know, like something that you should strive for. You know, it's not just about the UI. You don't learn this, you know, but perhaps an excuse may be, well, I'm going to do it just for the UI. You know, it doesn't matter the rest of the stuff. No, of course it matters. Yes. <laughs> right? That's for everything. Uh, yeah. I, 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 otherwise, these things are going to leak to your system, to uh, your, you know, like operation and bad things will happen. Okay, so what are some violations? What are the bad things that can happen if you violate the open-closed principle? Right, so in the example that we mentioned with the remote and the local uh, loader, data loader, imagine if, let's say, the view controller knew where this, uh, the, the data came from, right? Like we're talking about the provenance of the data. If that's the case, then you're, you're violating it because the view controller knows about a concrete location or a concrete type rather um, that the data come from. So uh, when you will need to change that, you're going to have to change the guts of the UI view controller. Okay, so if the view controller depends directly, let's say on URL session for fetching this data or any kind mm -hmm. of network component for fetching this data, and now you want to add a cache, you need to change the view controller to allow this new behavior. Exactly. So your view controller is not open for extension. No. You need to change it to add new behavior. Yep. Yep, exactly. And that's going to be more work. You're going to have to test things in integration, and it's going to be messy. It's going to be slow. Yep. You said it best. It's, it's <laughs> going to be more work and more risk. You know, like th this is... Exactly what you don't want. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you want to go fast, right? <laughs> yep. Yep. You want to go fast? need to go well. It needs to be easy to add new features. Yes. Right. It shouldn't require changes in multiple modules. It should just add, compose things differently, and that's it. That's Okay, so what you're saying now is, is another thing that you should be mindful about, right? So if, let's say you have a new feature or, you know, a, a requirement, something, and you find yourself having to add, you know, change, like, multiple uh, code in multiple places in a project, 
then you're breaking the the open close principle yeah. most probably. Because let's say there's two other developers working in the same system and they're also changing multiple modules. <laughs> yes. What are the chances you're going to collide at some point yep. and have merge conflicts yep. or break each other's code, yep. getting each other's way? Yeah. It's going to be yeah. much harder to work in collaboration. It's going to be much harder to maintain this long term, to compose this system in different ways. Exactly. And that's why you need to be mindful, as you said. Discipline. Yeah. You need to look for the signals, you know? Yes. Just look for the, the habits that you have in your behavior. Yes. And then, then you, you, when you find them, you can start correcting them if they're wrong. And to be fair, you cannot comply to the open close principle like 100%. You cannot have your whole system in a way that you can add features all the time without changing code. Some features are going to break your initial assumptions and require change. That's fine. Yes. Right? You cannot comply to it 100%. You cannot think about all the scenarios of the future. And you shouldn't as well. Exactly. Otherwise, you're going to be paralyzed. Exactly. You shouldn't. But changes should not require like cascading changes in the code base. Yes. And as you learn more about the system, you create better and better design, better abstractions. So you start understanding more how this system is going to change over time. Because you see like what part of the business is flourishing and that's more likely for them to ask more features, add more functionality in there. Yeah. Thus, that's the part that you should probably abstract a little bit more than the others. And over time, you're going to learn more about the system and improve it. And you keep tuning, tuning, tuning. So every time there's a new change, it's easy to add and it doesn't require changes everywhere. So you cannot comply to it 100%, but you should comply to it as much as you can and improve, adjust over time. That's it. Discipline. Yep. Mindfulness. Yep. Next, what is the Liskov substitution principle? The L in solid. So this, the, the Liskov substitution principle states that objects should be able to be replaced with their subtypes without affecting the correctness of the, of the program, of the system. Right. So what is an example? of the Liskov substitution principle in practice. Okay, so if you have a client component, let's say that depends on a cache protocol. Right, so the cache protocol is the type it depends on. Exactly, it's the type that depends on. Then it shouldn't matter if the client interacts with a, with a subtype of the cache protocol. Okay. Being perhaps an in-memory cache or a core data cache or something different, right? In memory, it doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter, yes. Well, it shouldn't matter. Exactly. Right? If you matter. have a good abstraction, <laughs> it should not matter which subtype you are talking to. Yes, yes, exactly. If it does matter, you're violating the list of substitution principle. Yes. So you should be able to replace an instance of an object with another one of the same type or subtype and not break the system. That's yep. it. That's what Barbara Liskov stated. And it sounds obvious, but you look around <laughs> your system and you see a bunch of violations of that principle. Yep. So let's have a look at a violation of the Liskov substitution principle. So what are some violations of the Liskov substitution principle? Right. So. I think the, the, one of the most common ones is that when you inherit or conform to a protocol and you just don't implement all methods or rather you implement the methods and you know, you have like a fatal error in there, something that can stop the execution of the program, something that will make the client reject the call, right? So let's say you have a protocol cache that has two methods, add and remove, right. and you have an implementation that can only add, can never remove. Right. So you implement only the add method and the compiler is going to force you to implement the remove one. Yes. And you implement it, but you set a fatal error saying not implemented, don't invoke this method. Well, you have an interface that says I implement two methods, but you only implement one. And if you call the other one, it crashes. Yes. So you're not implementing the protocol at all. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's exactly right. So you should be able to inject other instances to clients of the protocol and they should be able to call all of the methods in that protocol or any kind of abstract interface. 
Yes. And it should work. It should not crash because you invoked a method that they were not supposed to. If it's not supposed to, it's not a subtype. The method should not be in the protocol, maybe. <laughs> Again, mindfulness. Are you typing fatal error somewhere just because you're inheriting or, you know, Xcode makes you implement this uh, protocol stub? Yes. And you say, well, I don't want this. Thus, fatal error or something, you know, like some sort of weird behavior that perhaps is going to break the application. Then you're violating the risk of substitution principle. And that normally happens when you have a very difficult to implement interface. Right. Let's say you want to implement this interface because you want to pass this instance to a client. Mm -hmm. But the interface has 20 methods. <laughs> but I only care about implementing two or three. Well, if that's the case, you should create a new protocol. Yes. Which brings us to the next principle. Interface segregation principle. Yeah. So... What is the interface segregation principle? Yeah, the, the ISP states that you know components should not be forced to, to, to depend on behaviors that they do not use. So right? methods or types yeah. or anything yeah. they don't use. Exactly. So let's say if you are a client of a protocol with two methods, but you only use one of those methods, ideally, you should only know about the method you depend on. Yes, exactly. But that's not the case most of the time. And why is it not the case? Um, convenience. Convenience, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's like the, in the single responsibility principle, you, you want to add a new method and perhaps Xcode is open on a specific class. You say, well, okay, that, yeah. that, that, that seems correct. The same with protocols. You say, well, I don't know, like this seems something that my UI is going to use, right? And then you have like a data source, let's say protocol, and you just go and add that there because it is used in the UI for some completely unrelated uh, reason. Yes. And now this component knows about the UI because you added this method just to satisfy the UI. Exactly. So the same if you have like a protocol cache and you have multiple implementations of it. Let's say yeah. you have one method there to retrieve an access token. Yeah. Right. So you're caching access tokens. And you have the protocol that hides the implementation of that. Maybe it's a core data implementation, maybe it's a keychain implementation, or just an in-memory implementation of the cache. Fantastic. But now you need a new feature. You need to decode the access token and get a user ID from it. Now, yes. if you go to the cache protocol and you add a new method, like retrieve user ID. Now this protocol has two methods. Retrieve access token. Retrieve user ID. Yeah. When you should probably have broken it into yeah. two protocols. Because if exactly. you have multiple implementations of the protocol, all the implementations are going to have to implement the decoding of the user token. So this violates a bunch of principles. It violates the single responsibility principle. It violates <laughs> yes. probably the least cost of institution principle. Exactly. It's mayhem. So breaking down interfaces are going to help you conform to all of the solid principles the interface segregation principle. I'm not going to say it's the most important one because all of them are important. They are important. Yes. <laughs> there, there's not like, you can't say, but oh. it's key. Yes, exactly. To break down interfaces and only depend on methods you really need. And again, like this is about mindfulness and about, you know, observing your behavior. Think of it uh, like uh, in terms of making a fallacy, right? Like if you're, if you're saying, something always is going to have this behavior or like all of the subtypes of a protocol are going to have this behavior, right? right? Then you're committing a fallacy because, you know, most probably that's mm -hmm. not true. Always, never. <laughs> exactly, right? You want to hedge. You want to protect your system uh, against these fallacies, against like these things that, you know, at the time they seem logical, but... Uh, in time, you just don't know what's going to happen, right? You cannot predict the future, thus no. you follow the principles that are going to help you create flexible systems that if a new requirement comes, you're yeah. ready for it. Yeah. You're not just thinking in the future too much and wasting a lot of time doing it. I'm talking about 5, 10 seconds here creating a protocol. Exactly. You can even automate it if you want some kind of yeah. tool to create <laughs> protocols for you. I don't think you need it, but if you want it, if you want to save 2 seconds, you can do it. 
yeah, no, it's, uh, it's, it's definitely one of those, like you need to think about it, you know, like if you find yourself adding more than one method in a protocol, especially if the protocol is old, <laughs> you know, then you're probably violating the ISP. Yes. Right. Cause you're probably going to break a bunch of modules that depend on that protocol as well. Done. Is, is there anything else to say? Like even if it. they don't need the new functionality, right? Exactly. They're exactly. happy with just the old method in there. Now you add something else, you need to recompile, redeploy all the modules that depend on the client instead of just creating a new protocol. Yes. So again, discipline, because by creating isolated interfaces, you can test things easily in isolation. You can compose them in different ways. You can decorate that interface and add more behavior without yes. changing any existing code. You can conform to the open close principle, the single responsibility principle, and all the other solid principles. So just be mindful, understand the benefits and downsides of not following it. Yes. And in my experience, the upsides, it trumps, like it just wins against the downsides easily. Exactly. One of the downsides, more interfaces. What is it? More typing. Like How much typing? <laughs> yes. Not a lot. It's an interface. More typing. Yes. Like <laughs> it's not like we are programmers, you know, and that's what we do. But yeah, it's just maybe adding a new protocol or maybe adding a new closure, adding a new generic parameter, just separate it, rather than changing existing code, recompiling modules, breaking interfaces, violating the least call substitution. Because the more methods you add to your interface, the harder it is to implement it. That's exactly right. So that's it. So. What is an example of the interface segregation principle in practice? Well, as we just said, let's say we have a cache protocol that stores access tokens. And we have this new feature where you want to decode the access tokens. You shouldn't add a method to the cache protocol. You should create another interface for decoding the access token, segregate those two interfaces, implement them in different components, or maybe the same component is going to implement both. But doesn't matter. From the client point of view, you should only depend on the methods you use. That's correct. Maybe the same component is gonna is gonna implement both. There's absolutely no problem with that. That's it. So, what are some violations of the interface segregation principle? Again, messy protocols with loads of methods, especially unrelated methods. Yes. One is for retrieving the access token, the other ones for validating it. Yes. Those are two responsibilities. Come on, separate it. We don't see it in Swift that much often anymore, but especially when like in the early days of Swift, developers would bring the add objc optional uh, attribute. So now a protocol, you know, could have these optional methods. Yeah, if it's an objective C protocol, you can have optional methods. Yeah. But in Swift, that's not a good practice, you know, because if you want to have an optional method, what you need is a different protocol. That's it. That's it. <laughs> exactly. So separate your interfaces. It's going to help you conform to all the other solid principles. Yes. So other violations of the interface segregation principle? Well, protocols, they are hard to implement. They have too many methods. They yeah. have methods you don't want to implement. Yeah. That's it. Like if you find a protocol, you know, with more like, I don't know, more than one. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Right. Yeah. Ideally, you should have one method per protocol. Ideally, yes. But of course, that's not feasible. So follow the single responsibility principle. You look at this protocol, you look at this abstract interface you have and say, is this responsible for more than one thing? If yes, you separate the methods into three, whatever many interfaces you need. So you have single purpose abstractions that can be composed differently, tested in isolation, and etc. Exactly. Yes. All right. So when you feel like you want to add more methods to a protocol, stop and think. That's it. Most probably, you need a new protocol instead. That's the signal. Finally, the last one. What is the dependency inversion principle? Okay. Yeah. Uh, quite important. <laughs> So the dependency inversion principle states that high-level components should not depend on low-level 
components or modules, right? It doesn't matter in this case. Right. So what should they depend on? Abstractions, right? We mentioned that in the previous podcast, episode three, dependency injection. And uh, we talked about the dependency inversion principle where we said, basically, it states that components should depend on abstractions rather than on concrete implementations. Yes. Not like implementation details, if you like. And the low-level module should also depend on the abstraction, not on the concrete high-level component. That's correct. And for that to be possible, you should not leak any details of the low-level component in the abstraction. So let's illustrate it with an example. What is an example of the dependency inversion principle in practice? Okay, so the idea is instead of letting your high-level components, like the, the business rules, the interactors, depend directly on frameworks like core data, for example, you know, mm -hmm. th they should depend on some sort of an abstraction in between. Right. And then the core data implementation conforms to that abstraction. Because if you do so, you can develop, test, maintain, extend your high level modules, your policies, your business rules in isolation without the frameworks. Exactly. Right. And in parallel. And in parallel. Exactly. You can have someone working on the high-level policies, rules, and someone working on the low-level details, implementing the core data stack. I mean, that's what the abstraction is there. You know, it's like a contract, right? It's like a, a separator that says, yes. okay, the left side is going to do this, the right side is going to do that. And that's it. If both sides know what, it, what the contract is, what they are supposed to do, then that's it, right? They, they yes. don't need anything else. It's quite amazing. But again, you should not leak low-level details in the abstraction. So yes. if you're trying to hide core data, realm, any kind of persistent framework, for example, from your high-level module and business rules, but you're passing parameters through the interface like an NS-managed object, then you kind of are leaking the details of the implementation of the abstraction. Thus, during tests, you cannot test it in isolation. You cannot develop it in isolation. You cannot replace the framework with another framework easily during tests or maybe because you have a new framework. Exactly. That's, the, that's the, one of those mindful things you can do for applying the dependency inversion principle, understanding what goes in the, in the abstraction. If you find yourself typing import something, you know, like a module in a file that contains an abstraction, let's say like a protocol, you know, and this import module is from the detail side, the implementation details, then that's probably not good because yes. think about it. You want it to be decoupled completely from implementation details. That's it. That's the key. You want to invert the dependency instead of your business rules depending on low-level details like core data or any other framework. You want the frameworks depending on your business rules. Yes, through an abstraction. Good abstraction. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Okay, so what are some violations of the dependency inversion principle? Well, making high-level components depend on low-level ones. Yes. If you're passing core data or importing core data, as you said, in your high-level policies or business rules, then you're violating the dependency inversion principle. Yes, exactly. Uh, and overall, I think, like again, be mindful. If you are depending on concrete implementations, it doesn't matter if it's like a modular thing or not. You know, like just be mindful about that. You know, if you're introducing a dependency inside a component, it doesn't matter if it's from like initializer injection, if it's like a, a global mutable state, MPN context, all that stuff. It doesn't matter. Just be mindful. Understand like, is this ever going to change? Probably you don't know that. Thus, might might be a better thing to introduce an abstraction in between. Yes, it is. Like 99.9% <laughs> of the time, it is better. It's the easiest thing to do and it's going to save you so much trouble. Exactly. It's going to make your system more testable. Yes. Easily extendable, more easily composable. It's an easy trade-off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
So don't depend directly on frameworks. That's the first one. Yep. Then you don't depend on every module in your system. You know, create some boundaries. Yep. Create some good abstractions in between these modules. So you can kind of replace and plug and play with different implementations. You can compose it differently. Make your software system soft. Make your applications clean. Yeah. Easy to work with. Exactly. And that's how you laid out the, the foundation for making it soft. Yes. Because, I mean, all the solid principles on their own, you know, I mean, they're fantastic advice, right? But Guidelines. They're guidelines, right? You need the techniques to, to apply them yes. in your systems, right? So dependence injection is the way to go if you want to conform to the solid principles. Yes. And it's not a matter of if, like you, you should do it. Right? <laughs> yeah, it supports and is supported by the solid principles. Exactly. They are the patterns and the anti-patterns to avoid as well. Yes, exactly. So that's it, the solid principles. Yeah. Now, why do we need the solid principles. Why bother? <laughs> I mean... Do you want good software? That's it, right? That's the question. <laughs> do you want to build software that is a pleasure to work with? Do you want to collaborate better with your peers? Do you want to develop flexible systems, modular systems? They are easy to develop, maintain, test, extend, replace, reuse. Obviously, you want these things. <laughs> like These things lead to fulfillment, happiness, Profit. Like exceptional salaries, exactly. So, uh, yes, you want these things. And what happens if you don't have these things? Like, if you don't, uh, like, uh, apply the solid principles? Well, we mentioned in the beginning, bad things happen. Yes. You know? The code is going to rot. <laughs> Literally, yes. Like, it's going to be if statements, if statements, and close callbacks, callbacks. Like, that's, that's the yes. result. Not following the solid principles. Coupling every module depends on every module. So, like, a small change in a component breaks completely unrelated modules exactly there are no clean abstractions everyone gets in each other's way that's what happens hundreds or even thousands lines of code in a single component or in a single file i mean this is you know like you can't yes. work like that right i mean you can until you can't exactly, exactly. and then you have to rewrite it yeah <laughs> Not following the solar principles is a fantastic recipe for ending up with spaghetti code, spaghetti architecture. Yes. To go slow. Yes. I'm gonna go slow. Yes. Or not move at all. <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna freeze the development. You have to start from scratch. Yeah. It's never a nice thing to do, you know? Redo your work. It just doesn't sound good to anyone in that business. Yes. You're not gonna be cheered not going to be promoted if this happens. Yeah. You might even lose your job. I don't know. Hopefully not, but... Yeah, I mean, like, of course, like, these things happen every day, you know? Uh, that's why we're, we're saying these things. That's why we're saying, like, you know, this is the way to go if you want something better, right? Yes. If, if you don't care, like, that's fine. It's... If you want to make good things, if you want to create better software, better apps... Exactly. The solid principles are going to guide you. They're going to help you. Yes. And remember, it's not just about conforming to the principles. It's about achieving the goals of the principles. Yes. Create good software, flexible, modular software that is easy to develop, maintain, extend, test. Yes. And do all of this in collaboration with other developers. If you want to go fast, go well with others. That's it. Yep. So... Are they applicable to iOS and Swift, even though most books are in Java, C Sharp? Right. We just gave like all these examples of the solid <laughs> principles in, in Swift and iOS. Yes. Even some parts of Objective C, right? We we covered there. But yes. yeah, of course, of course. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's it, it doesn't matter if it's OO, it doesn't matter if it's uh, functional, yeah, procedural. Yes. It's normally applied in OO languages, but they are guidelines, they are principles that is about achieving a goal. And the goal is to create easily testable, maintainable, and extendable software, composable software. Yeah. You want those goals regardless of the system you are creating, regardless of the language, regardless of the platform. It doesn't matter. Yep. It's about the goals, not about the principles. And those principles are going to guide you regardless of the language, platform, paradigm. Yes. 
So yes, you can apply them to iOS and Swift, and you should apply them in iOS and Swift if you want a remarkable career. If you want a remarkable career, let's switch to you must, right? You must apply them. It's not a should <laughs> anymore. Exactly, because most developers are learning this. And if you're not, you'll be behind. Yep. That's it. That's the minimum. That's the fundamentals. That's the base for all the other principles that come on top of it. Yes. It's just the foundation. Exactly. Just the beginning. Your first steps. If you think you learned the solid principles and you're done and you are a black belt now, you don't need to do anything else. <laughs> no, that's the minimum. That's the bare minimum. <laughs> that's where yep. you start becoming a good engineer. And then you go to the next, the next, the next challenge. Yep. But you start here and you build on top of a strong foundation. So yes. Exactly. You must do it if you want a remarkable career. If you want to create great apps, that's what you got to do. Create a good, solid foundation. So, how can you learn and apply the solid principles? How can you build this solid foundation? Well, the easiest, most straightforward way of learning it is from others. That's it. Good, experienced developers that know what they're doing, know what they're talking about. Yep. Right? So, read the books. But just reading the books not enough. You need to learn from senior developers, from really experienced people that know the ins and outs of those principles. They can show you what happens if you do it, if you don't, why you should do it, why you shouldn't. Developers that can teach you. I think it's, it's all about structuring the darkness and the chaos, <laughs> right? Because once, like the first time you are exposed to these things, to the solar principles, I mean, it, it's uh, daunting, right? It's scary. So what you want is to find a way to structure and make known, you know, start yes. making known with the, the, the maximum acceleration possible, you know, yes. of like learning and understanding uh, these things, right? These principles and all these ideas behind them and how to apply them. Yes. Theory and practice. You need both. Exactly. Especially practice. Yeah. You need to apply, apply and apply it. And see what happens if you don't as well. Yes. You need to see it from multiple angles, in multiple contexts. Yes. In different scenarios. That's why I think like uh, going to people that have been through these things, right? Like, as you said, reading the books is extremely important. But you're going to open the book first time. They're going <laughs> to tell you, you know, like, again, these are fantastic books that we mentioned in the beginning of the show. But, you know, like, these are hard ideas to grasp the first time. It's counterintuitive. Scratch that. They're like you're not gonna you're not gonna understand these things in the first time, right? And even if you think to, that you understand them, then okay, good luck when you open your ID, you know, your like yeah. Xcode and start applying them. You just like you need to train, you need to practice a lot to for these things to make sense and yes. come intuitive, right? You need to practice. Yeah. Sometimes you're gonna fail. That's fine. I think that's good. <laughs> Like if you find yourself in a position where you don't know what to do next or you don't want to know what are you violating, that's good. At least yes. you have the idea that you're violating something. You know, like you're mindful that you're violating something. But, you know, it takes some time to understand what exactly are you violating and how you can fix that. Yes. So choose well your sources, you know, find experienced people, learn from them. Yes. If you have like a very good senior developer in your team, just yep. pair with them as much as you can. Just be around them and learn as much as you can. Even when it doesn't make sense, ask questions. Yep. Read the books. Take notes. Have discussions about it. You know, join a discussion group. That's how you're going to learn. You have to practice and start helping others at some point. Yeah. Because as soon as you learn something, you teach someone else. And you're going to find the gaps in your knowledge when they ask questions or when you're like, uh, I think, uh, if every time you say I think, yeah, you're not that sure. Yeah. Read again, apply again, practice, ask your mentors. That's how you're going to get there. Exactly. And that's how you go fast, by learning from people that know what they're doing. They are good at teaching and they want to teach you. Yes. Hopefully, you have this person in the office at yeah. work and you can pair with them anytime. If you don't, I know that most people don't, you have to go out of your way and find good mentors. Yes. 
Maybe join a developer group in your town. Maybe find someone online. Doesn't matter. Find good mentors. That's how you learn fast. That's how you progress fast. That's it. That's it. All right. Why is it so hard to apply the solid principles? <laughs> right. Why is it so hard? Why, why can't I just read a book and know exactly what to do? Why isn't that a formula? Why isn't there like yeah. an automated way to tell me if I'm complying to the principles or not? Why isn't there like a compiler that can tell me if I'm violating the principles? <laughs> Unfortunately, in my knowledge at least, they do not exist. But the, the answer is because it depends, right? Like every single time, it depends. There are guidelines, yes. Yes, it, it depends in your case, right? There's no like one silver bullet that is just going to mm -hmm. solve all your modularity issues or all your yes. dependency issues. No, like, and again, like you need to think about them all the time and things change. And once mm -hmm. you think, you know, like... Um, uh, modularity has been established and that's it accomplished done well you know like you have a new feature and now you need yes. to you know you need to plan accordingly and uh, ma maintain the modularity yeah and most of those things are counterintuitive yes you could even create automated ways to find indicators of those problems right yes let's say if you have a file with 3000 lines of code or even a thousand 500 yes. lines of code, you're probably violating the single responsibility principle. That's it. At least. At least. Now you have a protocol with 16 methods. You're probably violating the interface segregation principle and the single responsibility principle. Yes. So there are indicators that can help you find those issues. And if your component talks directly with a concrete class, you're probably violating the dependency inversion principle there. Yes. What we talked about in this podcast, like being mindful, understanding the signals, looking for the signals, you know, just because yes. you can do something, it doesn't mean that that's correct or it's going to, maybe it's correct right now. You show the UI, oh, it works, right? No, mm -hmm. like in the future, can, we, can it withstand new requirements? Can it withstand change? I don't know. Like if it conforms to these things, then yeah, probably, <laughs> you know, if it yes. doesn't, probably not, right? So Being time mindful. will tell. Yes. In other words, time will tell if your system is flexible or not. Because changes will come. Yes. With time. Changes will come. Exactly. And you're going to know if your system is as flexible as you think it is or not. Yes. And if it's not, you adjust. You create better abstractions. And you improve it following the principles. You're not going to get those principles right all the time. It's impossible. Not even Uncle Bob does it. No right. one gets the principles right all the time. Yes. But you get good at, as you said, finding signals, finding indicators that, that you're violating the principles. And a very simple way you can do that is through look for the patterns. For example, if you're creating a new feature or trying to add code in your existing feature, try to sketch out, you know, like the, in, a, in a dependency diagram and see right. what, what kind of arrows are going you know, from one component to another, right? Like if you have strong references everywhere to concrete implementations and like no abstraction in between, well, your your diagram is just going to show that. Yes. I mean, what else do you want? Like that's it. Like you're, th that's the truth. That's like the single point of truth there uh, for your design. So that's important. That's like another way for validating your ideas, right? That's another like way for finding these uh, signals. Exactly. And some of those downsides don't come immediately. Some of the downsides of violating the principles don't come immediately. It's not like you're going to add a new method to a protocol or you're going to add a concrete class as a dependency and you're going to see an immediate problem. No, no. No. But time, again, will tell. Yes. If something is easy to change, easy to extend, or if it's hard to change, and hard to extend. Exactly. So pay attention to the signals. Being pragmatic now is going to accumulate over time. It's going to come back to collect the debt. Yes. It's going to happen. And if you're still in there, if you're still in the team, you're going to have to fix it. Yep. I have no doubts about it. 
That's it's not going to be fun. <laughs> no. Do you want to go fast? Do you want to have fun? Do you want to deliver good apps? You need the solid principles. Yep. As a foundation, not only the solid principles, but you need it as a foundation to deliver great software. Exactly. For that, you need good mentors and you need to practice as much as you can. Be disciplined. Do the work. Do you want the spoils? Do you want a great career? You need to do the work. You gotta do it. There's no other way. Nope. No one no one's gonna do that for, for you. <laughs> yeah. Like it's it's very simple. So that's it. You need the solid principles as a foundation. And you need good mentors to guide you in this journey. Discipline. So you can take big challenges and collect big rewards. Yeah. Discipline chunks of code, you know. Once you make one, once you make two, you know, three, four, five, ten, then you start having a very disciplined uh, system, right? Yes. Flexible, modular, good systems. Exactly. Because it's the only way to achieve sustainability in this uh, industry, basically. Yes. So if you're after, after these things, then that's the way to go. That's it. Enough said. <laughs> okay. I think that's it. For this episode of the iOS Little Essentials podcast, please let us know your thoughts, your comments. And we are running a free workshop next week. You can find the link below to join the free workshop and start your journey towards a remarkable career. We'll be glad to have you with us. Until next time, bye, y'all. See ya.